are we on the air today? <laughs> yes, we are, because that is the name of our show. Welcome. <laughs> I am Sam DeLev, and this is our Children of Airte after show, where we in the Northern Hemisphere of Airte enjoy the ever encroaching heat of summer while our heroes in the fail put their snowshoes back on. Give us a month. We're really going to start envying them. And with me tonight, hopefully keeping cool herself, is the inimitable Deborah Anwol returning Aww. from theatrical glory Yay. with delightful voices now fully in stock. Thank you so much for joining me. And please say hello to the people. Hello, people, friends and enemies. Welcome. <laughs> So before we exposit our lore like it's on a two-for-one <laughs> deal, I must first hold forth about tonight's sponsors. <gasps> Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realms. We are giving away codes and you can type bang code in chat for a free Electrum chest in-game. Die Hard Dice, purveyors of clicky clacky math rocks. You can't use them as a ruler, but you can use them to insight check, said ruler. Use code Airte at checkout for a 10% discount. We're doing a giveaway in chat during stream and Sirenscape, because Epic Games require epic music. And with that out of the way, on with our show, albeit with a reminder. You too can ask our guest questions like, why does my neighbor keep insisting her garden gnomes are not from Lorilla? <laughs> By asking your question with question in all caps in chat. But of course, I, Get all garden gnome related inquiries first. It's in my contract. <laughs> really, I was a very forward thinker. So I get first question of the day. <laughs> and Deborah, yes. we've had some big lore drops in the past month. So, yes. how did you decide that now is the right time to deploy the garden gnome? <laughs> the garden gnome. Um, well, I mean, you never you never know when it's the right time, really. Um, I felt, you know, maybe a year was enough time to have kept our party in suspense. <laughs> um, also, I, I always knew, so I, I sort of think, you know, the great thing about druiding um, is that it's its own form of stealth, right? So that you can be, you know, you're just a little mouse, you're just a little squirrel, right? And then you can just kind of literally fly on the wall if you want to. Um, <laughs> listen in and get to like to get some information and strength. so in a way I knew I wanted Pivim to sort of I wanted Pivim to surprise them especially because they haven't really met very many other folks <laughs> in this place um at least not very many with information um and it's generally my adventures tend to be fairly isolating I I enjoy that kind of storytelling players really on their own to figure things out with their own ingenuity. I think that's just a stylistic preference of mine. Um, so a lot of my adventures have that, but I like the idea that like Pivim, if he's in the ocean and being a seal for a while, comes across this party and he gets to kind of spy in on them a little bit and see what happens. And then when he finally comes forth, he can do it because he's watched them for a while and knows he can trust them. Um, so that was kind of fun. I kind of, you know, I think the the last adventure lent itself to the sort of surprise. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't enough alone. surprises in that one. No, yeah. no, my goodness. Um, so yeah, so I don't know. I think, you know, they had done such a great job of exploring and finding things. And I wanted to, in a way, sort of reward them for all of this really great investigative work and putting things together and everyone had a great theory on what all this was and you know I've put limits on how long they can talk to Ivy and all of these things so I just wanted to make sure that at a certain point you say here you go um, now the great thing is though Pivim doesn't know everything he knows these worlds and he can kind of share some of that but a lot of the specifics and details are still left open and, and that would be a recommendation I would have for any DM is make sure that your NPCs only know what they know and that you always kind of leave a little mystery, uh, you know, behind. Did you intend some, do you consider mm -hmm. Pivim to be fairly knowledgeable about those worlds? Because we got a fair amount of information. Some of that is just from stuff that's very basic to me is entirely unknown to you. But, yes. you know, you got know stuff. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, he knows Lorelia, right? He knows his world. He knows the veil because he's been here for a while and he knows the stories. Now that, you know, that's another lovely little thing I've, you know, trick I've set up for myself. These are stories. They're not fact, right? These are not tales of history. They are tales of, of, of whimsy. And while those have a grain of truth in them, just as our fairy tale stories do, um, they are, they say more about the people telling them than they do about reality, um, the, the cultures that created those stories. And so I, again, it gives me a really great way to say, here's a little tidbit. I'm giving you a little bit of information about where you are and what this is, but nothing here is concrete or solid. These are clues towards where you are um, because these are just fairy tales, right? The, the Snow Queen is not exactly you know, Anderson Snow Queen, but he's been inspired by. And so it's fun to kind of, uh, you get to have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> you get to be, give information and be sneaky simultaneously. Surely, surely you're not suggesting Piven's an unreliable narrator. <laughs> we are all unreliable narrators, right? I mean, Don't listen, chat, you can trust me, definitely for sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, only Sam. Sam is the most reliable narrator. Uh, the rest of us are very unreliable. <laughs> oh, we have just a wicked question uh, from Fool Ooh. Squeaky. What is the best flavor of garden gnome and how should you cook it? Oh my goodness, flavor of garden gnome. Well, you know, most of them are are, are uh, 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 pretty hard and dry and ceramic. So I, I wouldn't recommend eating <laughs> eating the Erte variety of garden gnome. Well, um, all right, but I want to ask why garden gnome? They're in all of the, the fantasy fairy tropes in all the world. Garden yeah. gnome, we get garden gnome. <laughs> Thank you, by the way, for garden right. gnome. That's a gift. <laughs> I don't know. I think I've all, for some reason I've always been really interested in them. It's so interesting to me that like people buy little like gnomey figurines to put in their gardens. And I grew up in a city, so we didn't have things like that. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn. Yeah. So like, yeah, so it wasn't something that was part of my life growing up, but I know, I know that that's a big deal. Um, and it is, it's so different. Like I could be like, oh, if you, you know, if people put little rabbit statues or little deer statues like I would get that but little gnomes it's just so interesting that that is a choice and I like the idea that they're kind of protectors of the garden they look over things and and this idea that you know like what if they what if at night they do come to life and like go around and weed your garden beds and take care of things and I don't know there's something interesting to me about that kind of toy story-esque to it so should I understand that some past scribe carried the knowledge of bandicoot gnomes yeah. into Erte that we now yeah. experience them and can purchase them at our local Home Depot? Exactly. And that, and that potentially, yes, the, the scribe went and saw this and went, wow, these protective little creatures that take care of the the land and 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 love wildlife and flora and fauna um, and were so enchanted by them and the way that they looked that when they returned to Erte, they told the story and somebody wrote it or said, oh, that's a cute tale and made <laughs> made collectibles out of it. So our scribes are the connective tissue between these worlds telling the fairy tales that create resemblance between them and they could share anything that they have learned with our world. Sure, they but again, it's a game of telephone. And they brought Excuse us gardeners. Well, but they brought us a lot of things, right? I mean, we have lots of fairy tales of lots of different things. This is just the first sort of literal one that they've encountered. I mean, the Snow Queen is one. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying that Hans Christian Andersen was a scribe, but maybe he knew one or a scribe came and told a bunch of stories and those oral tales and traditions went into a game of telephone, right? So that, you know, that could be a story from centuries ago that a scribe brought to Erte and got told over and over and over again until the Brothers Grimm or, you know, Christian Anderson, whoever it was, sort of took it and made it their own and told that story. On the Erte can report that we have done some, done some investigation and discovered Hans Christian Anderson never denied 
being a scribe. Oh, <gasps> this is true. This is mm -hmm. true. He never said he wasn't. Tricky. So you mentioned that this fairly isolated, like, low NPC saturation yeah. of a setting yeah. is kind of a preferred approach of yours, which I didn't know. Are you maliciously mm. denying us that Minnesota accent? <laughs> I know. Are you kidding? I love doing that accent so much. Um, I, I think I, hmm, I don't quite know what it is. I mean, I'm an introvert by nature. Um, and so I, I generally don't prefer like large crowds of people. I'm much better one-on-one. -on -one. And even in this kind of scenario, I just, I find it's really, it's, it's a fear and a, and a weakness and a flaw. I just sometimes as an NPC, they'll ask me a question and I go, and I kind of freeze up. So I, I think I, I go low on the NPC scale, probably just because I'm still learning myself how I prefer to do it. Um, and I do, I mean, I just, I, my favorite thing at a table is to watch players figure stuff out, right? Like really I'm a map maker <laughs> and a puzzle maker and I just get to set you loose um, in my crazy escape room underwater with a giant <laughs> telepathic squid, you know, like, so, and then I just get to witness the incredible power that my players have with their imaginations to create this story. Um, and sometimes when I do a lot of NPCs or I, I, I feel like I'm guiding too much or they, they become so important so quickly. And I really, I really want the players to lead. And, and I haven't quite in my mind, my process figured out how to have an NPC truly follow the players instincts but still somehow be more knowledgeable than they are in the world. So I'm still, I'm still figuring out that balance, but I, I mostly I do it because I just love players and I, I want to see what they do. <laughs> I'm not as interested in what I would do. <laughs> I don't know. I think the last chapter illustrated a beautiful solution to the problem. <laughs> you can have all the NPCs you like and they will simply eat the characters have given it <laughs> just eat you as fast as they can yes <laughs> we had a question to that effect um from sudian what is your name for the abyssal elder entity slash kraken slash giant squid boss and uh why is it irma that, that <laughs> um so in my notes <laughs> This is a little hush hush. Don't tell the players um, <laughs> if they watch watch close your ears. I just call it the first one. Um, <laughs> that's a little. <laughs> Maybe you'll find out later in some other subsequent lore drop why I call them the first one. But they're the first one. Um, that's all I call them in my notes. I mean, they are. You know, essentially, my inspirations are always the the like the stories I love and the things that always inspired me and, and taking those, taking tropes and ideas that are so clear that you can say giant squid. And we all have kind of a communal, an amazing communal understanding of what that is. It's like telepathy, right? I can say giant squid and you see something. I have inputted a picture in your brain. And and I like the idea that with some of these tropes, we are kind of immediately on the same page um, because then I get to twist it on you, right? Like it isn't just uh, 40,000 leagues. What is it, 60,000 leagues? I forget what it is now. <laughs> 30,000 leagues under the sea, whatever it is. Um, it isn't just that story. It's now that plus this, you know, creepy, able to read your mind, able to manifest your greatest hopes and fears. Um, you know, I get to twist it a little bit, which is fun. But we're all we're all in the same story together, and there's something really powerful about that using trope to your advantage, um, without letting it take over, without letting it become predictable. Eat your heart out, Captain Nemo. <laughs> now I'm worried though, because the existence of first one suggests there might be. <laughs> I, I'm sure it's fine. We have nothing I'm to sure worry about. I'm sure it's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Uh, but do you have any sense of like when 
how on the nose to play those kind of tropes? Do you have some sort of like, okay, here is where I back off or uh, this trope isn't necessarily transparent enough to be that kind of shorthand right. you're talking about. Right, I right, need right. to lean in more. Right. Do you have a sort of like a heuristic for there? This is um, the fairy tale point that I want to hit. Right, right, right. I mean, I think, you know, I think I spoke, talked about this before. If it wasn't on the air today, then it's in, been in other podcasts and things. But I, just a great um, uh, um, exercise, like writing exercise that I really respond to was called the literary scratch test. And, you know, when you'd get allergy testing and they scratch you and they with something that you might be allergic to, and then they sort of, you look at the dots and you see what you respond to. So a literary scratch test, um, and I'm forgetting the person who invented it, uh, but they, the, 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 they give you questions, things like, you know, list five things that break your heart, list five things that make you gag, list five smells that you love or five that you hate or, and it's just a whole bunch of things, things that break your heart. Um, and anytime you're writing out those lists that something goes, <gasps> or you have a really immediate, strong, visceral reaction to, to me, that means I know how to write about that, that it immediately puts me in a space that I can be very inspired, unblocked, right? Like simple, like the stairs down to the basement, right? Like what a basic trope. Even those of us who didn't grow up with basements know what that is, right? Um, you know, spider webs, you know, in the ce you know, ceiling of the thing. We, we all have this uh, sour milk. Right. There are things we all respond to specifically, you know, un uniquely, but we all have a, a communal kind of feeling about it. And and so a lot of times, even if it's something that's really specific to me, if I know it really well, it's that idea of universality through specificity. So if I go something that, you know, something that that scares me or makes me sick or makes me sad, that's really specific to me. I know how to write about it in a really specific way that will make that telepathy happen, that will allow everyone else listening to see their own image, but that will correspond with what I'm doing because I know that in a visceral gut kind of way. So that's always my kind of test is that, that literary scratch test. Is it, am I a little bit allergic? Do I have a, a reaction to this idea or this concept? Um, and that's always a really good place to go. I had never been introduced to the concept of literary histamine, but I'm really <laughs> into it. I love that. It's I great. Mean, Even just as like an artistic like process or exercise in general, it's just interesting to see like if you were to answer those kinds of questions, what are the things that you go, ooh, who that really, I feel that in a very specific way. It's cool. Yeah. So in terms of things that have resonated with you or that are very close to you versus things that become close to you because <laughs> we know you are a research nerd and I a am. very good <laughs> company and as Rumpus Imperator points out this story's included some pretty in-depth dives we see what you did there on an incredible range of topics and so far how many of these things have you known about how many have you learned from scratch and how many were you just looking for an excuse? Yes. So number three, all of it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm just a, I'm just a, a geeky nerd. I just, I love math. <laughs> I love science. I love technology, especially mechanical technology. I think I'm, I'm just too old for, I mean, I'm fascinated by computers but I'm just too old for that to be like <laughs> a viable, maybe we'll see. Maybe I'll make some programming puzzles down the line if I can ever learn it, but specifically like the steam engine, right? And and the, the mine shaft and specifically like the mechanical, the, all of the literal things you have to do to create an elevator in a mine shaft, you know, a hundred years ago, you know, 250 years ago, you know, what does that um, require? How do you extract gold from stone at that point in time? Well, you use terrifying chemicals that today yep. <laughs> we know you should never work with. Um, it's just fascinating to me. Uh, I, I think I've never been very, I was never very good at history um, at school, but 
I love it through this lens, right? Learning about history through a specific lens like steam locomotives. Um, and so, yes, so the steam locomotives I'm fascinated by. I mean, I think I just, I love old trains and that idea because it seems so romantic and I was very allergic to it. Uh, and so I, I knew I wanted to do that research. Um, the mining and you know cyanide processing to get gold. I didn't know that one. I'll be yeah. honest, that one horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> horrifying. Um, but that's part of how they did it. It works, but it just you know, it's awful. Um, Research and, the strongest OSHA violations you can find. Yeah, the um, method. Yeah, and all of those, all of the the mines and how all that worked and how they go through is all all part of it. Um, the little old town, you know, I I, I didn't, I don't think I um, there wasn't like a ton of research there, but I certainly like looked up old mining towns and what would have been there. And when oh, I did a little bit of research on museum uh, dioramas and the kind of things that they, that they do, because I was like, it's a big museum. I was having so much fun with that because I really wanted, I really wanted the, the zombies to be hard to spot. And there's something fun about having like you know, which one of these is yeah. not like the other, you know. And um, there is that trope spooky. of museum comes to life. That's so yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So once again. Exactly. So once again, but the again, the twist gets to be that, you know, it comes to life and fake easy. and then one eats, one eats you. Yeah, but which one is kind of fun. Uh, so that, and then yes, diving. I had to do a lot of research onto how the diving works. And and again, you know, it's always like a step further. It's It's, it's science fiction in the true meaning of science fiction. I think sometimes people get science fiction and fantasy kind of overlapped a lot, but like true science fiction, which is my favorite reading is, is just that step beyond fiction, right? It's Jurassic Park. It's, yes. it's these, these like, you kind of believe it could happen if you just pushed it one step forward. And so not everything about the scuba adventure is absolutely possible, but it's all on the brink of it, right? It's all kind of, someday maybe someone much smarter than me could actually make this a plausible situation. Um, but there are, there's, I modeled that sea lab off of a real sea lab that is, you know, yeah. 60, 60 feet down and um, 70 feet down. Um, there is a diver's gondola that exists. It doesn't connect the way that works, but it does, can happen. Um, yeah, so all that's really fun. And I think also it, it's great inspiration because you start looking at diving and the actual dangers and things that you have to keep track of and you really don't get very much time on a tank and all of that and you know I think it's just I looked at that and I went wow this is really gameable I can I can yeah. make this a game I can I can say you have a time limit and beep 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 you know get going um there's something really interesting about that and I don't know, at least for me. I, I, would, I never I thought of a safety stop being menacing ex <laughs> until it was in the context of a chase. Yeah. I mean, leaving well, aside that it's the first time I've ever seen a safety stop in fiction. In fiction, no. But also, like, the, I mean, the, what's, it's so terrifying to me that when you're diving at that kind of depth that you can't just, you can't just escape, right? You can't just be like, I'm out of here and go up. You will kill yourself. So again, the trappedness of that is, again, again, I, I scratched myself with that when I went, that <laughs> is so scary that you could see daylight above you and air above you and know that you're running out of it and that you can't just do it. You can't just run away. It's just, it's just a great, uh, it's a great fictional device gimmick to use. And I, I couldn't pass it up. So I infer from context that diving is not a thing you've gone really deep into. Does this, yeah. has this process of research interested you or made you super hard nope out of the whole no, thing? I, I would love to go diving. I, I think my, my brother has trained for scuba. So he has his, you know, license or, you know, the, the, what you need certificate for it. Um, I would love to, I've been, I've been um, snorkeling. I was in the swim team when I was younger. I, you know, I have some, um, um, some skill in that area, but I've never actually gone the full way and done the scuba. And I think, I think with a really, you know, a trained, 
<laughs> guide in a you know in an environment that they've tested i wouldn't don't go into sunken ships people don't at home never do that don't go in sunken ships that's not a good idea well at least without somebody <laughs> yeah pretty pretty so that it's you know, that it's yeah. but i mean you know as long as there are no first ones there have your dive master go first Every dive master, and if there's a first if you one, run into into jelly into jelly folk into jelly people of any kind go the other way <laughs> go the other way but actually to that end of danger uh we had another question uh from sudian about yeah. the underwater arc because it did get really dangerous like they split the party like it was their job I, which, I love it so much oh that such good splits I love it Fantastic. so much. I, I'm such a fan of splitting the party. In fact, I told them, I was like, look, I'm not telling you to do anything, but if you split the party, I will never outright, like, uh, penalize you for that, yeah, right? Yeah. Because I am so, the, like, intercut, when you split the party and I can go from, like, this, 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 and you get a little cliffhanger and you get to cut over here and you get a little cliffhanger, like, yes, you might get hurt, you might die, there will be consequences, but I'm <laughs> never, like outright gonna punish you because you split the party like please do it because I think it's such dynamic storytelling and it allows these interesting pairings to happen where different aspects of their personalities come out I am all about it it, it was very surprising that at night underwater in a sunken ship they were like you go that way I'm like, I'm yeah. <laughs> so genius I mean but but at the end there, it was the closest I think we've ever gotten to a for real TPK. Yeah. So um, what can you tell us about the other side of this GM screen for that one? Because that felt close. Yes. So, um, I mean, they were all very low. I think, you know, at, at that time... It's, it is my job to make sure that everyone at the table feels the tension and is having fun, right? And it isn't fun if I just go, you have no options, you're dead, right? Yeah. So I do feel like when, when you're in TPK territory, you want to make sure you give options. So I want to say, hey, you're manifesting things with your brain. Maybe that's one way to go. Two. The diver's gondola is there. Three, you know, you have this many tanks. Like, they have options to make choices. Yeah. Um, some of them might work better than others, but I want to make sure that there's at least always one way for them to save themselves. Um, you know, I, I, I don't believe necessarily in just, like, torture killing your, <laughs> your party um, because I want them to feel encouraged to do dangerous stuff and to take risks. And if I knock you out every time you do that, the story is gonna get very safe very quickly. So I, I like the idea that anytime anyone is in that arena of like just a few hit points or death saving throws or whatever it is, that I, there's always an option if you're smart and if you choose to take it, that will kind of get you out of it. Um, now, who knows, they may at some point decide they don't want to take it or they'll make a, a terrible final choice and then it's by their hand and then their it's by own their hand. hubris that they have perished and that I feels think, much yeah. better to you apparently now i, I know. think so i think so i think you know you should know like robin during those underwater adventures there were moments where she was making choices or she was like i need to do this and if it means i don't make it you know but you do that's okay and it, <gasps> Yeah, but I, again, that's, I want you, I want to, if a character is going to die, I want it to be meaningful to the story and to the party. And so it should kind of be on their terms. Um, yeah, and then also cre making sure you create villains like, you know, the first one I could wipe them all out if I wanted to. Yeah. It's very, very powerful. Yeah. Um, but that's not what it wants. Right. I think also making sure that like your monsters and your villains have motivations and their motivations are not necessarily always just murder. Um, same thing with the jelly folk, right? The jelly folk have some, they're kind of in cahoots with all of that. And so they're not looking to just kill. So when they take Maeve down to zero HP and she goes unconscious, 
I mean, she's underwater. There is no way for her to live. That's it. Unless my bad guys have a different motivation than just murder, in which case they can make that work. Um, so yeah, so again, I, I always try in any fight or, you know, encounter that I know is going to be deadly to make sure that there are multiple ways to survive. And it sounds particularly important, the more powerful your enemy is, yeah. since, as you say, the first one is the uh, cephalopodal embodiment of rocks fall, everybody dies. <laughs> It could, it could have, yes, it could have gone very bad. <laughs> but again, I'm trying to give you hints. I'm trying to be like, this is not going. we're not getting it. <laughs> you know? Options in much the same line as you've talked about how you approach puzzles and agency mm -hmm. in much the mm -hmm. same way as you talk about not letting NPCs drive the car. Exactly, exactly. It all kind of falls into the same, same space for sure. Yeah. So good tips for anyone GMing out there. Options and agency. <laughs> Options and agency for your players, yes. Yeah. But since I have um, mentioned puzzles, it's like it doesn't even take a full three <laughs> beetle juices. It just takes the one. <laughs> uh, we have a question uh, from Imaginal Disc that, shock of shocks, I know. Uh, where they saw a prior interview about you using props and puzzles and how, if you have used that in your uh, DMing this campaign, or even just sort of the mindset that you put uh, towards some of that, like, how do you bring prop mindset to? Prop mindset, right. Well, so, you know, that's all the, like, papers that they find and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of that's flavor, you know, yeah. as much as anything else. It's just a way to kind of be like, one, it's fun for me because I get to make a prop. Um, and two, it's, it's something they can refer to, right? This way, especially like with the, the hand signals for diving, right? Um, it's, a, it's a one, a fun way to be like, look at the research I did. Yeah. <laughs> two, I got to do cute little doodles and I got to figure out like, why does this <laughs> exist? Like this is study notes for the test next week, which is fun. Um, and three, they get the information and they don't have to copy it down or write it out or, you know, because giving hand signals is a tricky thing. I can show you, but then you have to somehow write it down or collect it. And this is just a really simple way to say, here it is, it's usable, it's functional, and it's cool, and all the things combined. So, I, you know, I do think you, you don't want your props to just be, you know this is the type of money that they use. Here's a coin. Cause then it's just a prop that's kind of pretty to look at. I, I want my props to have function uh, to, to either like some of the fun, the tickets were really fun because they've had them the whole time, but it, they ended up being a puzzle, which was cool, you know, at the end there. Um, and so the idea that you could, you know, if I were at an actual physical table, I would have printed those out and handed them out to them at the beginning of the, the game. And the idea that like 20 weeks later, they might have gone, oh my God, and put them on the table and rearrange them to figure out how it goes together um, is very exciting for me. So that's fun. Um, you know, the digital space is definitely a different digital, you know, the online space is a little more challenging for that. So I'm trying to come up with ways to, to do that here. Um, we were just talking about word puzzles. Word puzzles are really fun and easy to do. We we're talking about uh, some more in the laps, which are... <laughs> Please tell the good people about some more laps because more I laps. today. Some of my favorite um, uh, uh, puzzles are <laughs> use some more laps, which are um, essentially words like like a palindrome, except it creates two different words. So um, something like spot or um, what is it? <laughs> spot or pots, right? So it's spot in one direction and pots in the other. Warts, straw. Um, so those are really fun. You can create a lot of really interesting puzzles using some more in the lap. Um, another fun one is like words. There's going to be a word for it that I can't remember, but words that um, you can change the stress on. So um, combat versus combat. Mm -hmm. It means yeah. two different things depending on where you put the stress. Um, reject versus reject. Uh, so there are a lot of really cool puzzles you can do with that. Definitely um, get that as a content creator. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. As a content creator. <laughs> as a content content creator. Um, 
so yeah, so I think, you know, finding fun, like those just exist and those concepts just exist. And, and so it's just about your creativity and how do you take that and make it a puzzle, right? I mean, is it a bookcase and there are titles of books and they have to pull the ones that have some more than a lapse in the, in the titles at the same time? Like the, you know, if it's Mother Potts and my name is Spot and you have to pull those two books at the same time, you know, like what a fun puzzle that is. And that's literally off the top of my head. Um, so yeah, there's just endless ways that you can just grab things, you know, like no one has a copyright on the crossword puzzle. You can make your own crossword puzzle, right? And so these puzzles just exist and you just have to find the fun creative ways to make them your own and insert them into the story. I had never heard props as a way of conveying information to abbreviate note taking before. Yeah. <laughs> that is so good. <laughs> well, it Though, should be functional. The, the yeah. prop should be beautiful, fun, and functional, I feel. I don't know that I had ever encountered one of those. And I I genuinely, genuinely have newfound respect uh, for prop <laughs> gaming as a result. Yay. Although I, I think if anyone had wished that she had access to some of those notes, it was poor Ivy trying to answer open-ended questions <laughs> in <laughs> sign about <laughs> what <laughs> element she had. But it's me, right? So I'm like, you know, she doesn't have hand signals, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm one. You know, but she's that's not what she's got. got. It's in a mirror. She didn't pack before she got stuck that's in the mirror. Right. Here's here's my other DM tip: make it fun for you. <laughs> so like, <laughs> set stuff up where where you are as vulnerable as your players. So like something like that, right? Like. She's, she's stuck in a mirror. Yeah. They can't hear her except for that one minute, right? So I, I've set up a situation in which they're gonna, I have to figure out how to play with them, not against them, with them. Um, and I think that's always really, really fun. I'm working on a, a, a new campaign right now where I'm, I'm trying to put in a, a lot of that, a lot of opportunities for the players to ask um like in the moment creativity of their DMs in, in what I hope is a really fun, safe way, but just so that it's not all about like, oh, where's my notes? But like, oh, I have to, you know, improvise whatever this is in this moment. Yeah. You gave me three words, you know, like literally the equivalent of like, you're a doctor, you know, at the grocery store uh, buying bananas, you know, okay, go, you know. A new take on the Herald. It's not yeah. just for Robin anymore. <laughs> it's not, no. Oh. But actually, you know what, speaking of Ivy, if we want to talk about the impact of some <laughs> lore drop yes. this past <laughs> month, I, I would say uh, she has herself been the business end of said lore drop uh, with the accompanying paranoia from our party. It's yes. not, it can't be surprising given that lore drop was rulers bad. <laughs> and discovery from Ivy is Ivy Ruler. But how how do you manage a party doubting a character like Ivy on whom the campaign's conceit depends, but the party has to be you know, a certain amount of paranoid or you don't live to level 20? Oh yeah. Well and and you know, don't don't for a minute think that's not what I wanted, right? Like you, I, right from the start, you're meant to have mixed feelings about who this person is, right? So, um, and, and again, most parties will. Most parties know that the DMs are, are maniacal and that <laughs> we're, we're trying to trick you every which way. But, but the great thing is that once you do that, it starts to feel more like life, which is really that you can't know and you have to go on some kind of gut. Um, because if if I'm a if I'm using tropes but I'm subverting them and sometimes in ways that you're not expecting and sometimes in ways that you were but it doesn't quite fit with how it normally goes, I I get to reintroduce this idea that you don't know, right? You really don't. Um and and also it might be more complicated. Maybe she's both. Maybe she 
is a ruler who caused some harm and maybe she's also trapped and deserves to be let out, you know? Like maybe she's deeply in love, maybe she's fooling them. It could be both. Right? Nuance. Right? It can be both. And 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 I I think ultimately again when we talk about player agency, uh if I make it too cut and dried then I've decided for them how to handle the situation. If she's clearly good or clearly bad, quote unquote, then we I've decided already how to hand for them how to how they're gonna handle it. Um but if she's more complicated than that, it leaves it much more up to them and what feels right for this story and this group that they're they're their story they're telling. Not that I'm telling, but they're telling. I mean there there was a certain percentage chance that this party's like well Pivim just told us you uh you get rid of the rulers ruler <laughs> squared away in this mirror done all right one down let's go well i'll offer this as well so another another again gm tip if whether you want it um layered in there right so my whole thing any any story goal should cover at least three types of motivation greed so you should get some kind of reward um pride so you should be heroic you're saving the innocent you're stopping the bad guy whatever it is um and and like curiosity right something you learn you'll get to you know be figure something out uh, or save yourself right so the great thing with this is it's a little bit of everything right so potentially there's this innocent woman you could save two maybe she's terrible <laughs> but you're super curious about it. Three, it might be their only way out. You know, I think I think from the information they have and what they're working on and what Ivy has shared with them, th this is their only lead. So in a way, I think if it's important to just the like progress of the story that they continue to find the shards and put them in, you know, there's a little bit of doubt, but there's also a little bit of need and that, you know, I think that's important to have multiple motivations working on any goal in order, if you really need it to happen. That way, the entire party feels motivated to do it. Um, and there's, there's just more likelihood that, that even if they're not sure about her, they're like, we have to risk it because this is the way forward. So you heard it here first, chat. If you need party to do something at minimum, uh, call out to two of the seven deadly sins. You might need to pull up <laughs> seven if you really need them. Yes, that absolutely. Plot point. Go with the go with the sins. They're always really, really helpful in terms of getting parties to do things. I mean, though you alluded to curiosity, which I know can motivate me to do <laughs> almost anything. Curiosity and also my character. Very strong, a very, very strong motivator. And I, you know, I think there's very few rules that I give a party up front. But mainly they are like, just follow the thread, right? Like that's my only sort of request. It's like, maybe don't follow the bunny rabbit into the field when I've told you there's a mysterious well, you know, unless the bunny follow rabbit the has moose. a top hat. <laughs> <Follow> the, <moose. laughs> if the bunny rabbit has a top hat and a stopwatch, follow the bunny rabbit. But you know, like generally if you can, you know, I'm gonna leave you some, some story threads. And all I ask is that you open, may remain curious about them and build something into your character that is excited to follow the mystery to to adventure even if it is only a love of adventure that you build into your character a reason to to follow the thread um but how you do that and what choices you make along the way i want to be totally free um but yeah just like we do in life you know just just keep that curiosity open yeah, there are a lot of ways to uh, get on board with the RPG social contract, but yeah. please do, for your GM's sake, uh, <laughs> though they will continue deploying greed and pride. We and work really hard, <laughs> so we want you to enjoy the, the fruits of our labor, so please enjoy them. <laughs> it's true. But yeah. for all of the paranoia about Ivy, they've taken to Pivim really immediately yes, and they have, they beautifully. Have no fear at all about Pivim, man. Pivim's the greatest, yeah. The power of the garden, no. The power I'm the garden, just no. saying. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but I really, really loved hardy. seeing Pippin's interactions with Neb in particular. Mm. And uh, Cassius had a fun question asking whether having Pippin be a druid uh, was intended, perhaps, uh, to help Neb with her wild shaping. Uh, and uh, that Cassius had been hoping uh, for an excuse to get Neb flying animals early. <laughs> um, it was, <coughs> excuse me, um, not intended to help Neb. Really, it, it, it spawned out of this idea that he could spy on them <laughs> as, <laughs> as a seal. Um, <laughs> Um, I just, I don't know, I, again, like, I just really, I had this image of, like, this cute little seal that's suddenly like, hello! You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I kind of just want to do that. Um, that's that's knew, all the justification anyone's ever needed, quite frankly. <laughs> there you go. Um, I mean, I knew, I knew, I knew that it would, it would immediately interest Neb, especially, you know, um, Lauren plays Neb is so curious and oh. so, you know, engaged with that. So I knew that it would immediately endear him to the party and, and get some trust. Cause I did, I did need him to drop some lore. I did need him to sort of function there. And, and I didn't want to waste like a whole, um, you know, a whole episode, a whole chapter, like gaining trust. Um, we do that plenty <laughs> in yeah. D&D &D, and sometimes it can be a little repetitive. So it was, it was at least a way to kind of be like, a way to make him instantly someone that they were really interested in talking to. And, and again, they've been lonely out here with no other NPCs really. So uh, it was good. And it worked out well from the last time, you know, Steve, you know, was a, was a, a beloved buddy that they met here. So I think, I felt pretty. I felt pretty confident that they were gonna. They were gonna uh, accept Piven pretty quickly. I mean, connect with one of the heart characters of the party is a very reliable way to get the party yeah. on board with an NPC. Yeah, yeah. But I have to hit you with the hard hitting journalism of on the okay. air today. Oh boy. Whose voice do you enjoy more, Pivim's or Nicholas? <laughs> probably, probably, um, probably Nicholas, just because it's a little bit, it's not as hard on my, my throat. Um, Nicholas is a lot of fun. He's so good. He's so cute. Um, Pivim, and I felt bad because I was doing the play and I, I was, in the, I, I was about to jump into it and I was like, oh, oh, I can't do this right now. Uh, it was like foolish D and D brain where I was like, "Oh, I'm so excited!" and then it didn't go. So I got to do it for the last uh, the last chapter, which was really lovely uh, to finally <laughs> bring Pivim out. I was a lot of practice. <laughs> he'll he'll settle in a little more as we go. Um, but yeah, I think I think voices. I'm not a great I'm not great at accents. Um, other than my my Minnesota, I do very much enjoy my Minnesota, <laughs> and my New York is pretty good. But uh, but I do like voices. I think you know that that can be really fun. It doesn't always have to mean an accent. Um, it can just mean placing it in different places and you know plugging your nose and blah blah blah. Voices like you know I don't know. It's just kind of little funny tricks you can do um, to give something a whole different flavor. Character voices are more than accents. Don't worry <laughs> if your French accent is horrible. Chat though also. Maybe that character has a horrible French accent. Or or it's a game and you yeah. lean into the silliness of it. And yes, it's supposed to be an authentic French accent, but you can't do it. So you sound like Pepe Le Pew and we have a good laugh and you move on, you know? Because Honestly, very... that is the apotheosis yeah. of gaming. There's yeah. that it, that's it. That's the win condition. Just I think always remembering that this is a game. It is meant to be about fun at the table and great stories. Um, and that, and that, yes, it is a, as a DM, you want to put yourself out there so that your players feel comfortable to put themselves out there. So in some ways, if I do a terrible French accent, it encourages them to, to lean into their <laughs> discomfort yeah. a little bit, try things. 
we actually have a question a little bit along those lines hmm. from Cole 12 Monks. Uh, the first 11 monks did not write in, but we do have Cole <laughs> now asking how you would facilitate a spirit of role playing, uh, particularly at a table perhaps of more technically or tactically inclined players, especially if you're you're that theater kid at the table, uh, that yeah. one player embracing the role playing aspect. How Gosh. do you, how do you yeah. get there? Or Gosh, how do you so do hard. your part? You're not going to change right. people, but how do you? Yes. How yes. do you move the needle? That is that is so tricky, and 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 you know, table chemistry in that way is important. And I have absolutely there have been a couple of times where I've run games for parties where I'm like, oh, oh, I'm not your DM, right? Like, like let's run this. I will lean into the game you like to play, but like, this is you should probably find somebody else because this is not my strong suit, you know, kind of thing. And. And you're not, again, you're not going to have as much fun playing my game and I'm not going to have as much fun DMing for you. And this is about fun. <laughs> so it's okay if we're not always a perfect fit. Um, but I think, you know, not all of us have the luxury of finding multiple, you know, people to play with and going from party to party and all of that. So I would just, you know, make sure that everyone at the table knows what excites you about the game and especially if you're a player make sure that your 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 game master knows um the things that excite you and what makes what's fun for you and and if they're a good game master they'll make sure that there are opportunities to sort of let you experiment in that um and then i would say if it is a tactical technical kind of group um just remembering that there are out of the box ways to be tactical. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, again, if you're, if you're in a party of a lot of fighters or evocation wizards or things like that, like maybe, maybe you're the bard arcane, or sorry, the rogue arcane tick trickster who uses illusion, right? You know, like there are, there are other ways to be helpful. I remember I, I was, I was playing a rogue arcane trickster and it was a big battle and there were animals loose and things like that. We were maybe fighting a lion or something like that. And my, everyone else was just fighting. They were just in combat and throwing things at each other. And my character kind of liked animals. So I was like, oh no. So I created the illusion of a cage around the lion and it failed its check. So it genuinely thought that it couldn't leave this little space. And it ultimately stopped the battle or at least kept that one contained so that the others could go and fight other things. And I was like, that is a tactical play, right? That's not just yeah. role play, that is tactical, but it is free thinking and out of the box and creative in the way that I think I like to play, which is just yeah. slightly, <laughs> yeah. slightly off beat, you know? Yeah. Um, there so are ways have, to be creative that are not. Yeah, you have ultimate control during your turn and, 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 and it's perfectly fine, you know, flavor things differently. Again, you know, like there's text in the in the spells and in the books, but you it can be anything you want. I mean, if Children of Verite teaches you anything, you can flavor stuff however flavor you want. So much. Right? So if something is a is a is a whip, you can make it a tentacle. It essentially works the same way, right? You can just change the, what type of damage it does or however you want. You know, there are things, there's so many different ways to just say, when I cast this spell you see mist come out of my mouth and it travels and loop to loops over itself until it swirls around the head as long as you're not mechanically changing anything you right. can tell the story any way you want so I, I would absolutely own your moments um when that happens you know when it when a tactical dm says i hit you for 13 points you go oh the arrow lands in my chest and i pull it out as the blood gushes down you know like you can even if the others don't want to do it on your time you can 100% lean in. To your yeah, time. it's your time. Your time, yeah. I mean, my takeaway from that, of course, is at any point in combat, you can make animal friends. Absolutely. I don't know what you were intending to convey, but that's what <laughs> I glean from this. Story. At any time. <laughs> uh, we have another question from Maverick 2 that simply delights me. Oh, um, hi, Maverick. I know Maverick 2. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Yeah. A consistent and delightful on the Airtay contributor, Maverick yeah. 2. 
um, who wants in this particular circumstance to know which one of Robin's jobs has surprised you the most? I was kind of surprised that she knew scuba. I have to say. Oh, yeah. When I, when I was writing it, I was, I was like, oh, this will be fun and they'll have to learn how to do it. And I was like, oh, wait, I wonder if Robin already knows. <laughs> which means my research is going to have to be that much more on it um and it turned out she did so I, I I think I actually like texted or I, I emailed hope that night and was like hey just curious don't tell the others <laughs> but does Robin know scuba and she was like yes and I went okay so now but I was glad that I asked because I, it allowed me to rethink a little bit how they were going to get the information and uh fast track through some of that which was good um but yeah, that that because that was so consequential to the yeah. story, and I I it didn't like occur to me right up front. That was probably the most surprising. So you don't have access to the master list of all of the things Robin has done that, I that mean, Hope has said she has. I th I think I, I mean I probably I may have access to it. I could. I mean I have access to all of their like um, you know their D and D Beyond sheets and stuff no like that. But, from you. But generally, well, but I don't generally feel much inclined to look at it I feel like I like players to be in charge of their characters and and beyond the things that like backstory wise or patron wise or familiar wise or things that like rely on me to bring them into the story that I want to know so I want to know your backstory I want to know your flaws and your traits and all those things um your bonds but I but generally like you're the expert in you and in your character and and I'm not I'm not really designing things specifically to you this is just a world again I'm a map maker I'm just a glorified map maker and you get to explore the map uh and whoever you are is who you are and that's exciting um so yeah so I I might have access to her list but I'm I'm certainly not trying to write towards it it's just a fun coincidence when she happens to be an expert in like the big thing <laughs> i mean look you never know when it will come in handy to have yeah. been a body double for a dead body on set you that never time. know super I, uh, I would be in that document just to read the wild and wacky <laughs> things robin's done not well, even hoping... for the game just like tell me more about this character I know. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm hoping throughout, you know, this game, this long, epic game, we'll get to hear lots about her life. Do you think by the end of the campaign, we will have gotten the exhaustive list of things Robin has done? I don't know. I don't know exactly how long it is. I mean, she's only like 80, right? I mean, she's... Oh, only. Yeah, no. Only I mean, 80. She's only I mean, 80. You know, that's like, that's like 60... 65 workable years in there and you know i'm sure she took some time off to like relax yeah but there are some temp jobs that are you know three months how many of those <laughs> kind of years did she have how many of those true years? true that whole notebook is just filled i'm so excited <laughs> um and it is marginally related to my scuba question from earlier, but since you said you were a trains fan, and since we have some new adventures coming up, yeah. never to also ask which of the adventures the players have experienced thus far, and I will add, or perhaps some, any upcoming, okay. uh, would you like to do? Hmm. I mean, underwater is pretty. It's pretty Help for us are beautiful man. and close by. I mean, okay, so a big, a huge, huge, huge uh, inspiration for that adventure is Sphere by Michael Crichton. If you want to talk about great science fiction, go read Sphere. It's very, very scary. Um, uh, I that Michael excellent. Crichton. Ooh, oh, it's so good. Up. Sphere. There's a movie with Dustin Hoffman and Lee Schreiber and uh, Sharon Stone and Samuel L. Jackson. It's very, very good um, and very, very spooky. But the book is fantastic. Uh, so... I think, you know, part of me was like, man, I would love to be in Sphere. I should make an RPG where you get to play the plot of Sphere. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I actually kind of can do that. <laughs> um, 
so it, it is a little bit in that in that vein of um you know being trapped in an underwater sea lab with uh, something that is dangerous um yeah Sorry. i won't <laughs> ask for particulars you don't even have to answer but would you want to go on the adventure that the players are heading to now? Oh, this one? Yes. Yes, absolutely. But again, I'm writing, I'm, I mean, general good writer's tip is like write stuff you'd want to read, right? Write stuff as a gamer, write something that you'd want to play. Um, you know, I do think that's like, that's another, the, the NaNoWriMo folks have the Magna Cartas and you write two Magna Cartas and one of them is stuff that you love in books and the second one is stuff that you hate in books. Because sometimes we think we have to be like really good writers and like write about really important, serious things, but we don't actually enjoy reading those yep. things, yep. you know, but we think that they matter in a way that's significant. And so we're sort of push ourselves into that. And they really say like put those above your computer or wherever you write and remind yourself that if you start to go off into the territory of like good writing because you think you're supposed to you're never going to be as good at it as you are about writing about stuff that you really love and something that you would really want to read so in the same way i kind of i kind of only write stuff that i want to play um so yes i'm very excited about bell castle cap and <laughs> what's going to happen there, I, or what might happen there, I don't know, what they will find there, the, 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 the glorious, glorious map that I have created for them to explore. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's inspired by things that I love and things that make me itchy, and I'm very, <laughs> uh, very, would love to go on that. You know, the worst, the worst thing is that you don't get to play your own adventures, um, you know? You know, and I, I need someone else to write me a Deborah Ann Wool style adventure so I can I can go on it. <laughs> well, chat, you've heard it. We have all taken up the challenge. Please create beautiful new adventures suffused yeah. uh, with palindromes and garden gnomes because <laughs> that is going to do it for us tonight. Please don't forget to tune in next week for our regularly scheduled Children of Erte and watch our heroes. Stay cool. I envy them already. And thank you so much for joining us, Deborah. You want to say real quick uh, where the people can find you? Oh, I am under my name on the socials, I suppose. Uh, Deborah Ann Wohl, W O L L. Uh, Deborah's the old D E B O R A H, the old fashioned spelling. Um, yeah, I've, I'm not super active on my socials, but they're there. Uh, and sometimes I, I will definitely post about like upcoming things and stuff like that that I'm a part of. Um, but yeah, you can find me there and you can find me here every Tuesday night uh, or almost every Tuesday night <laughs> um, running an adventure. So exciting. Perfect. So catch those adventures. But until next time, we're going off the air today. <laughs>